Hi, my name is Joe, and I'm one of the pastors at Redeemer Lincoln Square. Now, let me read for you today's passage, which comes from uh, various texts, uh, various verses in Deuteronomy chapter 24. Do not take a pair of millstones, not even the upper one, as security for a debt, because that would be taking a person's livelihood as security. When you make a loan of any kind to your neighbor, do not go into their house to get what is offered to you as a pledge. Stay outside and let the neighbor to whom you are making the loan bring the pledge out to you. If the neighbor is poor, uh, do not go to sleep with their pledge in your possession. Return their cloak by sunset so that your neighbor may sleep in it. Then they will thank you and it will be regarded as a righteous act in the sight of the Lord your God. Do not take advantage of a hired worker who is poor and needy, whether that worker is a fellow Israelite or a foreigner residing in one of your towns. Pay them their wages each day before sunset, because they are poor and are counting on it. Otherwise they may cry to the Lord against you, and you will be guilty of sin. Do not deprive the foreigner or the fatherless of justice, or take the cloak of the widow as a pledge. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. That is why I command you to do this. When you are harvesting in your field, and you overlook a sheaf, do not go back to get it. Leave it for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow, so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. When you beat the olives from your trees, do not go over the branches a second time. Leave what remains for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow. When you harvest the grapes in your vineyard, do not go over the vines again. Leave what remains for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt. That is why I command you to do this. Amen. Now here, what we see in this chapter is uh, that we have a series of laws that were really designed to protect uh, people from economic oppression. But more specifically, uh, we see that there's special attention uh, given to those who were especially vulnerable to oppression, right? The widow, the orphan, the sojourner, and the poor. And really, these laws cover three areas of Israelite life in the Promised Land, right? Different kinds of financial transactions. One is when it, uh, the topic of loans. Now, loans of that day were not like loans of today, where you would, you know, get loans from a bank, let's say, and they make money off interest that is accrued upon uh, that loan. And as we've seen earlier in chapter 23, actually, Israelites were not allowed to collect interest from their fellow Israelites. No, these loans were actually meant to be provision uh, for the poor. Right? These were temporary loans that were meant to uh, help them with some kind of collateral or a, a pledge, right, to really give them a head start in rebuilding their finances. And with that being said, even though they may have collected pledges from the lender's perspective, even their handling of these pledges were to serve the interests of the poor and not block their access to the basic necessities of life. And that's why if you look at verse 6, it says a millstone should be taken as a pledge because that meant the the borrower then would have no means uh, to make bread and to provide food uh, for their family. And we get the same story really in verse 17 where clothing uh, from a widow must not be taken as a pledge. Uh, But even if uh, clothing was taken from anyone else, uh, we see that it needed to be returned by nightfall uh, when it gets cold so that they may cover themselves uh, with the clothing. And so really what we get, the picture that we get here is this uh, financial arrangement of loans always needed to have the interests of the poor in mind. So that's the first topic. But the second topic that we see is the topic of wages. And in verse 14 to 15, uh, tell us that workers needed to be paid promptly, right, by nightfall. Because with the poor, they were living from paycheck to paycheck. And so if they were not paid for that day, it, it very much meant that they weren't able to provide the basic necessities for their family for that day. And so that's the second topic. But the third topic is in the topic of gleaning. And we saw some aspect of this uh, previously in chapter 23. And it comes up again here. Because looking at verses 19 to 21, what we're told is that the owners of the fields and the vineyards vineyards were commanded to not over-harvest, but were to really leave 
uh, some behind uh, for those who do not have fields of their own to go then pick them up as provisions for themselves. And really, if you were to take these three topics as a whole, uh, you really see the priority of God towards those who are poor. Right? And the entire uh, financial structure of the nation of Israel was to be built up around God's concern for the welfare of the poor and the needy and not around the material gain uh, of the wealthy. Now, at this point, I want to read you a quote from a commentator named Dean McBride. Uh, it's a pretty lengthy quote, but I think it's really helpful for us in understanding uh, not just this chapter, but this whole uh, section here. And here's what he says. Matters treated in this division bring into relief the social policies that the covenant community is sworn to protect. Above all, the sanctity of life and the worth of individual personhood. The quality of justice is measured by responsible procedures and specific results. Egalitarian justice, like political life itself, can only be practiced in a social arena where basic values collide and concrete decision must be made between divergent human interests. So it is that most of the statutes in this division deal with issues of conflict in which individual lives, livelihoods, and personal liberties are directly at stake. The consistent witness throughout is that each member of the larger community must be treated with the dignity due someone whose life is infinitely precious. In short, this division details just what it means for the covenant community to claim identity as a people holy to Yahweh your God. For if holiness involves setting Israel apart from all other nations, it does so by making sanctification of life at once the prime objective of the whole social order and the political prerogative of everyone who resides in Israel's midst. Here's what it's saying. For many of us, when we think about the poor and the marginalized, we tend to be pious and perhaps even emotional in our care for them, but for far too many of us, and myself included, right, concrete action is not usually taken. But here in the nation of Israel, their, ent their entire political prerogative of everyone who resides in Israel must be towards the sanctification of each and every life in their community, including and especially, especially uh, the poor and the marginalized. And so here's the question for us as it pertains to this, con uh, this passage specifically. Do our finances, do our financial plans revolve around our concern uh, for all of humanity, uh, the, for the humanity of everyone, excuse me, uh, especially the poor and the marginalized? Or are they put in place uh, only and, and uh, primarily uh, for our financial gain? And that's something that I'm thinking through, and let me invite you to think through some of these things as well.